So hello everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us today uh, for this week's lecture and planning series presentation. Um, our speaker today is Professor Francesca Rossello Ammon, Associate Professor of City and Regional Planning and Historic Preservation at the Weizmann School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, my name is Joe Hennigans. I'm a PhD student here in Columbia's Urban Planning Program, and I'll be moderating the session. And so I'll just start with a few uh, logistical announcements and then I'll introduce our speaker. So during the talk, uh, I'd like to remind audience members to please mute their microphones. Um, we will be recording today's uh, lectures. Anyone uh, who wishes to not be recorded to just turn off their video input. And the chat box should be used only for discussion regarding the session. Um, and if you have any technical questions that apply only to you, please just message me or my co-host Maureen Abihanan privately. And we encourage all of you to type questions into the chat box during the presentation. And after the presentation, we'll have time for a question and answer session. So we'll start the Q&A around 2 or 2.15, um, so we have enough time for everyone's questions. And I'll be coordinating the Q&A with attention to diversity and inclusion. So uh, if you've already had a chance to ask a question, please allow others to do so before asking another one. And to ask questions, there are two options. Participants can either use the raise your hand feature, and I'll call on you to unmute, or you can ask uh, you're, you can type your question into the chat box and, and I can read them out loud. Um, so lastly, uh, before introducing Francesca, uh, I just want to acknowledge that PhD workers at Columbia, including myself, are currently on strike. Um, this strike action marks the two-year anniversary of the start of collective bargaining process and the continuing failure of the university to bargain in good faith and reach a fair contract. And this lecture series is arranged by PhDs on a volunteer basis. It's not part of our official work obligations. And because of this, we feel it's appropriate to continue with the talk. So I did, however, want to note the strike at the beginning uh, and encourage those of you who weren't aware to learn more at columbiagradunion.org. So with that, uh, I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker. Francesca Russello Ammon is Associate Professor of City and Regional Planning and Historic Preservation at UPenn's Stuart Weitzman School of Design. A social and cultural historian of the built environment, she's the author of Bulldozer, Demolition and Clearance of the Post-War Landscape which is the winner of the 2017 Lewis Mumford Prize for the best book in American planning history. She's particularly interested in post-World War II American cities, focusing on the history of urban renewal and revitalization, public history as a tool for community-based research and engagement, and the ways that visual culture has helped, uh, has shaped understanding of what cities are, have been, and should be. She holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Princeton University, a master's degree from the Yale School of Architecture and a PhD in American Studies from Yale. Her research has been supported by the American Council of Learned Societies, Society of Architectural Historians, Mellon Foundation, Whiting Foundation, and the Ambrose Monell Foundation. And she's currently working on a history, writing a history of post-war preservation and urban rural based upon the Philadelphia neighborhood of society, of Society Hill. So Professor Ammon's talk today is entitled Urban Renewal Through Preservation and Rehabilitation. And it will consider the urban renewal era in America's cities, in particular, the little known impact of the Housing Act of 1954, which for the first time introduced federal funding for rehabilitation based approaches as well. So I'm sure it will be an insightful talk on the complicated implications of a lesser known aspect of, of a part of urban history. So Professor Ammon, uh, if you're ready, I will pass things over to you now. Thanks very much, Joe. Thanks to Joe and Maureen for inviting me today. Um, let me share my screen. Can everybody see that? We can. Okay, great, thank you. Um, yeah, so, so thank you again. And I, I wanna acknowledge, um, as Jill mentioned, all the volunteer labor that went into organizing the series of playing talks specifically for PhD students and the broader community here at Columbia. I'm really delighted to be a part of this um, diverse uh, series of speakers. So let me get going here. Okay, I also want to recognize the many institutions, repositories, and research collections who, whose materials and knowledgeable staffs um, have informed this research to date. Uh, many of these institutions are still closed uh, due to the pandemic um, and are limited to digital access, but I want to encourage everyone to make use of these uh, existing resources digitally and again once they're available to us in person. I could not do this research without their wonderful collections and support. I also want to highlight the effort of several Society Hill residents who set out to document the social history of the neighborhood by conducting almost 100 oral history interviews uh, with area residents, those who lived there before urban renewal, those who moved in as part of the project. Um, 
And uh, they called their Endeavor Project Philadelphia 19106. That's the zip code of, of the neighborhood. And I joined efforts with them and, um, and, and some other members in the neighborhood um, to create a website where they could archive those transcripts, those sources underpin uh, the site that we call Preserving Society Hill. And I have the link here and I encourage you to check that out as well. I draw up on a lot of these materials in, uh, in my comments today. All right, so let me begin. Um, when Congress passed Title I of the Housing Act of 1949, it provided essential government support to enable the clearance of blighted areas of US cities and the stimulation of primarily private efforts to rebuild them. This was an effort to, quote, reverse the suburban tide, as one uh, New England mayor put it, and support the growth of cities' populations, businesses, and tax dollars uh, within the context or of post-war urban crisis. Critically, the act authorized federal grants to cover two thirds of the cost of acquiring and clearing land for redevelopment. That act of clearance of creating deceptively blank slates for new modern development was a foundational element of the program, right? You couldn't get the money unless you had a plan to clear away what was there before. And it built upon a similar provision of earlier public housing legislation from the 1930s. Politicians, planners, and many members of the public, in fact, celebrated demolition itself as progress. And you can see that sentiment expressed in both the smile on Robert Moses' face in the photograph on the left um, as he drives a bulldozer, as well as in the children's book depicted on the right called The Affable, Amiable Bulldozer Man. Doesn't he look pleased with himself as he tears down this building uh, from 1880? And so nationwide, the Housing Act of 1949 spurred de demolition on a scale that was previously unseen in the United States. Uh, during the 1960s, which was really the peak moment uh, for this destruction, on average in cities across the country, one out of every 20 dwelling units fell. And it was much more, more pronounced in some of the cities we know well from urban renal history. In New Haven, for example, uh, it was more like one out of every six dwelling units fell in the 1960s. But experience gained in practice, coupled with increased understanding of urban needs, soon made it clear that demolition alone, demolition paired with new construction, would not adequately or economically cure all of a uh, city's problems, nor could it help prevent the spread of blight to areas that were just beginning to deteriorate. And that was the, the premise of the Housing Act of 1949, really was grounded in slum clearance as the way to, to way forward. So with the Housing Act of 1954, Rehabilitation and conservation joined demolition as federally funded tools for a real uh, New cities could use federal dollars now to conserve buildings, not just to demolish them. So my talk today really considers the prevalence, the character, and the impact of the second approach uh, to push post-war urban revitalization. And I look specifically at one of the landmark projects where this was put into practice, the Society Hill neighborhood of Philadelphia, uh, with a particular eye toward understanding how different or not rehabilitation was from its demolition alternative. And this work grows out of my teaching at Penn and ongoing research for a book project, as well as the Preserving Society Hill Digital Humanities Project. So it's work in progress, and I'm really happy to have this chance to share it with you. Um, there are multiple reasons why rehabilitation appealed to post-war policymakers and practitioners over clearance alone, um, at least as a complement, and certainly not as a replacement for, um, for demolition. But cost and speed were really two of the primary motivators. As I've shown in the book that Joe mentioned, uh, Bulldozer, large scale demolition proved to be both expensive and slow. It produced massive amounts of rubble, which was difficult and costly to dispose of. And some uh, less scrupulous developers sometimes resorted to burying uh, refuse underground on their projects. They couldn't find a place to get rid of all these materials. Other pieces of debris littered cleared lots for years, decades even, as it often took much longer to rebuild than it did to tear down, particularly as developers were initially slow to sign on for some new construction, thereby imposing a different kind of blight on renewal neighborhoods. It was particularly troubling for people who lost their homes for these projects to then re return years later to see that nothing was even there in, in its place. And although whole blocks were envisioned to come down en masse, Difficult relocations and legal opposition by some residents led structures to come down in a much more patchwork pattern instead. Um, in the image you see here, the entire block at the center of the photo will come down, but it took actually about a decade for every, every one of those structures, whereas um, you know, cities had priced things out, assuming that contractors could come in and just tear down the whole lot all at once. So contractors would have to switch to smaller, less efficient equipment. It took longer, it cost more money. 
This process even bankrupted some companies in the process while also costing cities much needed taxes when new construction was delayed. And many cities saw acres of parking lots as the extended replacements for the former areas that they were hoping to upgrade. Now, by contrast, rehabilitation could be a much swifter and cheaper effort. For roughly the cost of demolishing a building, never mind the additional cost of building something new on its site, a basic rehabilitation job could be completed. Plus, much of the money for rehab work uh, would come from property owners, not the government. For this reason, as Stephanie Ryberg Webster, among others, has shown, it was actually often planners rather than historic preservationists who were at the, the forefront of advocating for rehabilitation over demolition. They were not suddenly converts to historic preservation. Rather, they simply supported the simpler, less expensive option. Of course, rehabilitation also appealed to preservationists for its conservation of historic fabric and sense of place and uh, community members at times. But making preservation synonymous with modernization required a real cultural leap, uh, a leap of faith. As the Housing and Home Finance Authority wrote in late 1960, quote, architectural character in individual buildings, blocks of buildings, or whole neighborhoods can be achieved or retained if false conceptions of modernization are not followed. So what they're saying is that an acceptance of rehabilitation as renewal required that modernization not be strictly synonymous with new construction. Rather, updated buildings from the past could also achieve a modern city. And we can see how much of a change of thinking this really was by looking at this photograph of Mayor Dick Lee of New Haven, Connecticut. See how proudly he stands before these uh, Life magazine photographers who photographed him uh, in front of cleared land behind him. This is land for the Oak Street um, Expressway. For Lee and so many others, demolition equaled progress. Um, and in places like Philadelphia, planners would argue that the restoration of history equaled modern progress just as well. Now I'm struck in this image the way that, that Lee, if he's blocking anything, he's blocking the new building going up. What does he want us to see? He wants us to see the clearance. And that was his idea of progress. But quickly, um, this will start to change um, as, these, as these lots remain empty for too long. So in November 1963, nearly a decade after passage of that 1954 Housing Act, William Slayton, the commissioner of the Urban Renewal Administration, testified to Congress about the impact of the rehabilitation-based leg legislation so far. Understandably, there was a lag between legislation and action. But by that point, he reported, there were 225 projects nationwide that included a significant amount of rehabilitation, about three-fifths of which were already in execution. Thus, out of a total of over, over 1,300 urban renewal projects that had been initiated by then, those projects that included rehabilitation made up roughly 17% of the urban renewal program to date. But rehabilitation encompassed variable portions of these projects, so maybe it's better to look at individual buildings. How many buildings, how many structures uh, were rehabbed um, versus demolished? Uh, again, by mid-1963, Urban Renewal had demolished approximately 129,000 structures and rehabbed over 17,000 structures. So it's about 12% of the buildings. So it's a small number, uh, but it's a start. And the future looked bright, as Slayton uh, reported. He said, it's especially gratifying is the fact that the number of dwelling units on which rehabilitation had been completed rose nearly 37% during the last fiscal year. Now, several factors also limited the pace and scale of rehabilitation progress. Foremost among these were the, the higher touch nature of this enterprise relative to clearance, um, and also the challenge of financing for smaller scale property owners and developers. Whereas large developers would typically take the lead in remaking sites for clearance, often utilizing super block designs for towers in the park, rehab projects would require the efforts of many more individual investors. And Slate noted that rehabilitation quote, requires a personal effort by the staff of the renewal agency to work with these property owners because these property owners are not particularly sophisticated. They do not know how to go about dealing with contractors or the particular kind of improvements that they ought to get or how much this is going to cost or how to go about getting a loan. And so each property required tailored solutions. This wasn't something that was going to be easily scaled. Financing was probably an even bigger challenge, though. Um, the Housing Act of 1954 anticipated this by introducing Section 220, which provided new FHA mortgage insurance for use in rehabilitating dwellings and constructing new dwellings in urban renewal areas. Um, in essence, they tried to base the assessments of mortgage risk, mortgage risk on the future development in the area, not on the current conditions. Uh, it made it possible for larger loans, a small, smaller equity investment by private capital. 
Um, one exemplar case of the new mortgage policy in practice uh, Slayton reported about to Congress took place in New Haven. He said that a homeowner there um, it enabled him to reduce his monthly mortgage premiums by half due to the lower interest rate and longer repayment term. Um, and this, this was a game changer in making these projects affordable for the individual investors who were going to do the work. Um, and he hoped that this financing would, would be a kind of magic bullet. Um, he said, I call this the magic of 220 financing. It's the real key to making rehabilitation work. Of course, the policy didn't always work like magic in practice, though. Uh, for example, in Philadelphia, uh, officials reported about several challenges of property owners facing as they applied for 220 mortgage loans in a low-income area under undergoing rehabilitation. Um, in that project, there were 490 properties to be rehabilitated. Yet by 1964, the city could identify only one example of any affirmative FHA action in that area over the past five years. And it was for a property located on a boundary street. What happened was that in practice, insurers were still risk averse about investing in these properties in, in these neighborhoods. Um, and so it wasn't as easily applied as it was um, on paper. And further, when mortgages were offered, they were often not in the amounts that owners required. And while this type of housing was precisely that which the program was intended to address, banks' hesitancy to lend could partly be explained by the fact that, relatively speaking, the highest volume of defaults occurred in projects located in urban renewal areas and insured under Section 220. So it was a tricky undertaking. As you well know, I'm sure, there were many critiques of the clearance approach to urban renewal, as encapsulated in some, these seminal works that you see on the screen. Um, the critiques related to the sometimes dubious definition of slums applied to these neighborhoods, the loss of salvageable, even valuable architecture and sense of place, and the economic inefficiencies of leave, leaving such large swaths of often downtown land vacant and underused for so long. But the destruction of community was really one of the most poignant of the critiques. Across the country, urban renewal displaced nearly a million families and over 100,000 businesses by 1980. Nationally, the burdens of renewal were not evenly distributed. Non-whites experienced almost two thirds of the displacement, aptly earning the urban renewal program the nickname of Negro removal. Rehabilitation, however, offered the possibility of reducing displacement. And as Slayton told Congress in 1963, rehabilitation is to bring the area up to improve the area for the residents who are there so that there is not the exodus, exodus, the movement of people, the relocation of families. Rehabilitation makes it possible for people to stay in their neighborhood. That was his hope. Now the federal government tracked urban renewal displacement by project through 1966 in this uh, report. And these reports have been digitized and um, are available on a website, wonderful digital humanities website um, called uh, Mapping Inequality. And if re rehabilitation were truly effective in reducing displacement, one would expect displacements per urban renewal housing unit to have gone down following the Housing Act of 1954. And as you can see here, that does appear to be the case. Now, some of this was likely due to in the increasing prevalence of rehabilitation, but other aspects of it could reflect the proactive departure of residents from neighborhoods as they saw urban renewal coming and therefore fled the neighborhood before they could be included in the official count. So it's it's hard to, I don't want to overinterpret this, but it is a trend that suggests uh, displacements did go down. But individual projects, I think, can tell us much more about the character and impact of rehabilitation and preservation-based urban renewal projects. In 1963, the very same year that William Slayton was reporting to Congress about progress with rehabilitation, the Urban Renewal Administration sought to further stimulate such projects by publishing uh, this, this publication, Historic Preservation Through Urban Renewal, which gave 14 example projects in progress to demonstrate the applications of Title I to conservation. While 14 examples may seem like a, a reasonable list, the relatively limited extent of historic preservation within these individual 14 projects suggests that there was still a long way to go in making conservation an integral rather than more token outcome of urban renewal. Let me take you through just a few examples of these. Um, the Gates House project in York, Pennsylvania was one of the projects featured. It was four tenths of an acre in size, um, admittedly tiny. And the report noted, when the project was decided on, rundown buildings covered the area. Now only the two historic buildings will remain. Um, and you can see much of the site was replaced with a parking lot. Um, the buildings that were saved were from the Revolutionary War period. So I suggest this very limited understanding of what was considered historic and worthy of saving. In the Marcy Washington Streets project in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, across nine and a half acres, 12 buildings were saved. 
but 60 were removed. Again, preservation is not the dominant uh, method being applied here. Mobile, Alabama's East Church Street project proposed to save 10 buildings across six blocks while clearing two thirds of the area for public use. Now, all these projects really took a much more curatorial approach to preservation, endorsing demolition in order to help restoration where the gems stand out. Some projects even relocated historic buildings or proposed relocating them from elsewhere in the city to create kind of outdoor history museums in these sites. Notably, all the projects um, that I'm mentioning were, were located in predominantly white neighborhoods, nearly 90% white, in fact. Although on average, roughly two thirds of those impacted by urban renewal were non-white. This suggested that preservation was only deemed appropriate in communities of a certain racial character. Otherwise, clearance would dominate. The report highlighted at least one exception to that trend, um, and that was in Washington, D.C.'s southwest neighborhood, uh, which was 560 acres in size, and where African, African Americans represented 70 percent of existing residents. This project incorporated historic preservation as well, uh, but it integrated just six historic buildings into a new townhouse development. Um, but urban renewal destroyed roughly 99 percent of the buildings that previously occupied the neighborhood making these six structures noteworthy, but again, largely token in their significance. And this was one of the 14 projects being celebrated for its embrace of historic preservation. By comparison, both the Worcester Square project in New Haven and Society Hill in Philadelphia stood out for their large scale preservation based approaches to urban renewal. This may be why William Slayton highlighted these two projects in his com comments to Congress. Upon viewing the before and after photographs that Slayton presented, which I'm showing you here, one congressman noted, the transformation of those houses is so dramatic that I would think that either the rent or the cost would be so substan substantial that I would wonder if the same families could live in those. Slayton confirmed his suspicion that indeed there was still much displacement. Thus, large scale conservation practices when applied may have saved significant numbers of buildings, but they did not always save their communities as well. So let me dig down uh, deeper into one of those two projects, Society Hill to explore a bit further about what preservation and rehabilitation-based urban renewal meant on the ground. Um, we can hardly find a better subject than Society, than Society Hill. Uh, planner Edmund Bacon, who's pictured here, often receives much of the credit for Society Hill's success. And I wanna play just a brief clip of him speaking specifically about his rehabilitation-based approach. And I hope I've set up the audio so that you can hear it. Please interrupt me after if, if it didn't work. I would reduce the clearance to the absolute minimum. I would very carefully tailor the edges of it so that I didn't take anything away except that what was necessary to just um, restore strength and health. Society Hill took its name from the Free Society of Traders, which was a business entity that settled in the area during the 18th century. The name fell out of use over uh, around the time of the revolution. Um, and at that time, the area only encompassed about two to three blocks uh, heading west from the Delaware River. Charles Peterson, an architect with the National Park Service, who you may know from having established tabs, um, who moved to Spruce Street in the Society Hill neighborhood prior to the start of urban renewal, um, rechristened the neighborhood with this historical name. And that's why it gets known as Society Hill. In planning documents, it's called Washington Square East. Throughout the renewal of Society Hill, Peterson was an active advocate for preserving as much physical fabric as possible, sometimes to Edmund Bacon's chagrin. Here's a, a, a Brief clip from Peterson. I'm a conservationist of buildings. That's my business. I believe in it. I've fought for it. I'm covered with scars. They weren't all here in Philadelphia either. And uh, you run into people that have this enormous power and don't give a damn, you're bound to collide. Now, when the Free Society of Traders was active in Society Hill, uh, mansions mixed with housing and businesses of tradespeople. Um, alleys serve different uh, classes than the, the major streets. And over time, an African-American population concentrated in the southwest corner, extending into the seventh, seventh ward of W.E.B. Du Bois' famous social survey. Uh, that's what's indicated by the pink color on the map here. Uh, at the start of renewal, African-Americans represented 20% of the neighborhood's population. Starting at the turn of the 20th century, much of the neighborhood came to be occupied by residents of Jewish, largely Eastern European descent. Uh, they're indicated on here in, in the blue shading. And owners gradually subdivided row houses into multifamily units. Commercial, industrial, and residential development mixed throughout this area. 
by the mid 20th century, the neighborhood had grown, grown increasingly physically dilapidated, as indicated by the ratings of D and E on the scale of uh, A being the best, E being the worst on this appraisal map. And this is not a, a Hulk map, but it's, it's the same type of a real estate investment risk assessment map. Now, planners applied a clearance approach in unit one of the project. Uh, there were three parts of the urban old project in Society Hill, two of them being significant in size. And this is the northeastern part. All the area that was to be torn down was indicated by this hatched kind of gray shading. So you can see uh, they started with clearance. And what they were doing was demolishing a wholesale food market that had gotten crowded over time and which the city wanted to relocate to closer to the southern portion of the city where we currently have our stadiums. So you can see what that market used to look like. Um, on that former site, they would build three high, high, three 31 story high rise towers designed by IM Pei. Um, he also designed some smaller scale row houses too. And this is really classic clearance based urban renewal as practiced across the country. But Philadelphia showed its distinctive approach to renewal as it moved south and west of the towers. Observers came to call the city's combination of rehabilitation and infill construction the Philadelphia cure. That is, as, um, as Bacon described it, clearing cities, or as an author, I'm sorry, in um, Architectural Forum described it, clearing cities with penicillin, not surgery. Although Philadelphia was not alone in this approach, it implemented it earlier and at a larger scale than most other cities, and it gained national prominence for its leadership in publications from Architectural Forum to Time Magazine. You can see uh, Pay, I'm sorry, Bacon depicted on the cover here with the facade of Society Hill Towers behind him and that lantern indicating um, the, the restoration work that had occurred in other parts of the neighborhood. Now, at Urban Renewal's outset, Society Hill was primarily populated with 18th through early 20th century row houses, uh, mixed use, sometimes multifamily buildings, and industrial structures. And I know you can't read this too clearly, but this, uh, I hope you take from this image a mixture of uses um, in the neighborhood. The shadings and hatch marks uh, suggest this from 1942. Yet planners would deploy renewal to isolate uses, making Society Hill primarily residential in nature and federal, Georgian, and, and modern in architectural style throughout. The Philadelphia Redevelopment Authority's plan for the renewal of Society Hill drew partly upon a visual survey conducted by an unknown photographer. Uh, there was one card, uh, this set of, of images for the survey, one card for each block in the neighborhood, and each numbered image corresponds to a street face marked in red on the map. We can certainly imagine how they would have done this uh, in GIS today, but it's a really uh, wonderful physical document that exists at the library company now. The cards document the clutter of fire escapes, awnings, garage doors, commercial signage, parked cars that marred otherwise clear streetscapes, or I'm marred, um, I'm, I'm channeling the planners here and what they were seeing and looking around the landscape. As throughout the country, these images helped illustrate the meaning of blight in advance of slum clearance for urban renewal. People are noticeably absent from most of these pictures, most of these before images, suggesting a perhaps implicit effort to focus attention on the physical over the social, although the two were intimately entwined. It's not surprising then that anti-renewal activists often place people at the center of their resistance campaigns. Now, in the history of urban renewal, though, Society Hill stands out for its relatively fine-grained approach to urban renewal that joined clearance with smaller-scale infill construction and historic preservation. And that took place in unit two of the project, uh, which is the southern portion of the neighborhood, extending from Spruce to Lombard, second to seventh streets, if you know your Philly geography. A third unit, unit three, was uh, just a narrow strip to the west, and I, I won't really touch on that today. Looking at a single typical property gives us a sense for the kinds of transformations that took place in the neighborhood. In January 1957, a photographer captured a stretch of Philadelphia row houses uh, located at the northwest corner of South Fourth and Pine Streets. The surviving image reveals the dense mixed use character of this area at mid-century. Um, if you could zoom in on this photograph, as I have, a Spanish language electronic store occupies the first floor with housing above. This was a working class neighborhood where median income was half the city average. Uh, more than 80% of the housing units were rented rather than owned and less than 4% of adults had completed college. Just over a year and a half after this photo was taken, Philadelphia, was, uh, Philadelphia approved Society Hill's first urban renewal plan. Now, when C.J. Moore purchased 352 South 4th Street from the Deve Redevelopment Authority in 1966 for about $10,000, his purchase agreement included these detailed restoration specifications for the exterior of the building. 
um, more recall spending an additional $130,000 on this renovation work, right? On top of the 10,000 that he spent to buy the property. Now, three decades later, a photographer named Bernie Clef re re-photographed this same intersection. And all vestiges of modernist commercial and, and next door to that building kind of Queen Anne style are now gone. They've been replaced with the clean uniformity of high Georgian residential architecture. Um, you can spot them to change it yourself, but I'll, I'll highlight a few. The commercial and replacement windows uh, have given away to historical replicas. Shutters have returned to the first and second floors. There are new marble steps, uh, new lampposts on the, on the street. Street trees have been planted. These many modifications announce the building's residential rather than mixed use character while also covering over its more recent past. On the interior, interior in the backyard though, restoration standards did not apply and property owners had much more free reign. So you can see new modern windows going up in the back and the interiors were outside the historical commission's purview. And what did Moore do, and that's a picture of him in his, in his home, really stripped the building down to the studs uh, and rearranged it. The city's historical commission also supported maintaining interiors, but they lacked any power to um, require that. So these interior photographs, which were commissioned by Moore, the property owner, showed the completely modern interior post-renovation. They capture the architect um, for the building, for the restoration, himself seated on the wall to wall carpeted living room floor, the new central staircase and the contemporary kitchen. Uh, a restored exterior paired with a modern interior was not uncommon. Here's a, another property from just down the block, um, uh, which was renovated by its, own, its owner, who was an architect himself, Robert Parsky. But other owners chose to apply historical accuracy both inside and out. And really, this is where you get the small scale power um, of individual owners to uh, tailor properties to their preferences. Uh, at this site, 217 Spruce Street, Agnes and C. Jared Ingersoll were among the earliest wealthy suburbanites to settle in the renewing neighborhood. As Agnes told a reporter in 1961, quote, we decided to put it back as nearly as possible to its 18th century condition, condition, adding nothing but heat, electricity, and a minimum of plumbing as unobtrusively as possible. My husband even suggested restoring the privy instead of putting in bathrooms, but he looked relieved when I said no. Yet another permutation on the possibilities is embodied in 419 Pine Street. Um, and these are all just in that unit two area that I showed you, uh, where the owner constructed a, a new building. This is a neo-colonial design, uh, but used um, um, discarded materials from other buildings. So the yellow pine ceiling joists, doors from other properties that had been demolished, marble fireplaces um, that, he, that he acquired at, uh, at junkyards and, and antique shops and created a home of his own. The modern examples of new construction are more obvious. I mean, you have to look closely at the previous uh, building that I showed. And I think a lot of people are fooled that it looks like an older building. Um, on the 200 block of Delancey Street, architect Romaldo Jurgula constructed a new house on a double lot for Franklin and Lynn Roberts. And you can see this one. You also see in the image on the left, that comfortable mix of old and new side by side. That's one of the neighborhood's hallmarks. Here's another example um, on South Third Street, um, designed for Francis and Harriet Kellogg by Hans Egley. And there are many other properties that I could point to, but I wanna get us back to our focus on restoration. So how did the city and homeowners decide what a restoration should look like? The redevelopment agency um, included general rehab guidelines as part of the deed of sale, as we saw for, um, for CJ Moore's property. And owners typically had two years to complete the work after they purchased that, the property. Then the owner would have to check their proposed design with the historical commission before proceeding with the construction. A review, review at the end would certify the restoration as complete. This is a drawing uh, that C.J. Moore's architect, Kip Stoll, sent to the historical commission for his client's property in 1966. The commission though suggested some changes, including retention of a doorway on the fourth street facade. And I've drawn in the, the streets there on the photograph to assist you here. Um, Stowell had only included a Pine Street entrance, as you can see in the drawing here. And the basis for the commission's recommendation that they put the door instead on 4th Street was an 1860 photograph of the building. The chairman of the commission told Stowell, and this is the photograph they're referring to, because the record is incontrovertible, the commission strongly recommends that the doorway as shown in the 1860 photograph be restored for the sake of historical accuracy. <laughs> 
The commission had discovered this image uh, by chance uh, in May 1962, half a year before the redevelopment authority had even acquired the property and someone had written a note on it, uh, a must for restoration. So they knew that these photographs were going to be really important in shaping what the renewed neighborhood would look like. Moore responded to their request with a detailed counter argument. He went to the basement, he examined the interior, um, and looking at the foundation, the first floor concluded that that Fourth Street entrance was an addition and that the one on Pine was the original. And he took some photographs of his own to prove it. Um, his argument passed muster. And so he was allowed to build the door as he preferred. This demonstrates the Historical Commission's willingness to deviate from the historical photographic record. But in the absence of further evidence, the photographs uh, were supreme. And they provided important evidence um, of what restoration should look like, just as they were important evidence of what blight was when buildings should come down. But the incontrovertible evidence of these images was really only valued when it aligned with preconceived planning goals. Photographs were read selectively. Uh, and an example of this, um, showing how contemporary design preferences could really supersede photographic proof, comes from this same site. Moore pointed out in his letter to the Historical Commission that that 1860 photograph uh, showed what one could clearly make out the word coal next to the door, signaling that the building had actually have housed mixed use commercial for at least 100 years, right? They were interested in where's the door in this photo. They weren't interested in talking about this had been a mixed use property. Uh, why? Because they were getting rid of the mixed use to align with contemporary uh, design preferences to kind of mim mimic the suburbs and the city as part of re renewal. And so the photographs, again, uh, were not incontrovertible proof as the Historical Commission uh, mentioned in its letter, they were read selectively. The general eradication of the commercial portion of mixed use properties led to first, flo first floor facelifts across the neighborhood. Here you can see the many varied facades on South 4th Street at, with 352 Moore's property at the far left end there. Uh, on the right, you can see 352 undergoing its renovation. So all along these blocks, the first floors were transformed as part of their restoration. A few doors north on South 4th Street, here's another before and after pairing. Again, mixed use giving way to strictly residential. Not all these neighborhood businesses easily gave in to urban renewal. I have no record of that Spanish language um, uh, record shop protesting their removal. Uh, but that was not the case here um, at the southeast corner of Spruce and 4th Streets where Harry Altman's Royal Hand Laundry, which was just a collection sp station for laundry. There was, it wasn't a, an industrial site. It was sent off site for that kind of cleaning um, where this was located. By 1960, Royal Hand had been in operation there for more than 25 years and various commercial uses had occupied the site for over 100 years. Altman himself, who ran the, the laundry, uh, lived upstairs. With the onset of renewal, Altman had an architect design a new colonial front for the building. He knew that's what planners wanted, and he contacted the redevelopment authority offering to modify aesthetics, but not use. And he was told, as he reported it, your property will be condemned. Neighbors signed a petition asking for the businesses to stay. The petition noted, we are desirous of Mr. Altman continuing to render laundry and dry cleaning services as he has done in the past, and we therefore pray that Mr. Altman be allowed to continue and use and rehabilitate his property. Now, the signers even included Charles Peterson, that uh, important Philadelphia preservationist that I mentioned who happened to live a few doors down on this block. Um, so even in the post-war decades, preservationists envisioned a version of their field that allowed for individual residents and uses to remain alongside restored architecture. But the planners had a more limited definition of preservation and felt that exceptions for commercial use would put the whole project at risk. So Altman lost out. And you can see the removal of that commercial front and replacement with a purely residential facade. And this is how the building looks today. And here's a clip from a documentary produced in 1961 showing Altman and residents discussing the multiple sides of this issue. Uh, first of all, I have my whole life invested in this neighborhood. I, uh, the business was left to me when my dad died. I had to support my mother sister, brother. Uh, in 1948, I finally was able to buy this building where I'm at. And I struggled very hard to pay the mortgage on it. And finally, in 58, I was through with the mortgage. And I felt a little more secure. I've been working all my life for that, to try to make my middle-aged years a little more secure than what I had it before. 
I chose to live in Society Hill above any place in the world because of its great convenience, because of the wonderful neighborhood stores. And Harry Altman, I think, renders a great public service. He not only cleans my clothes beautifully, does all my laundry, washes sheets and underwear, everything, washes things beautifully, and he's just a pickup, you know, they go on to other places. But he cashes checks for me. If I say my heels are run down, where's the cobbler? He said, I'll take it to the cobbler's for you. Or I run out of bread and he loans me a loaf of bread or just anything. He's, he's a magnificent neighbor, and I'm very proud to have him for a next-door neighbor. Suburban renewal as impl implemented in Society Hill also required the demolition of entire buildings for a variety of reasons. One block over from Harry Altman's laundry on South Fifth Street was to be one concentrated location where shopping would take place. So they would get rid of all the, the mixed use throughout and concentrate uh, a very smaller portion of those um, in, a, in a new central location. Um, you can see the large amount of proposed demolition as indicated by the dark gray shading on this plan here on the left. This would be the site of new shopping facilities. The buildings that came down, at least on the east side of South Fifth Street, appear in the photo on the right. And here's the new supermarket that replaced it. It was initially an AMP, uh, it still exists today as an ACME. The whole concept of a supermarket, though, had both the centers and supporters, and, and we'll return to that video uh, for some reactions. I think it's wonderful to have all the shops near you, especially when you're an old lady like me. I can't be running away to shopping centers six blocks away on rainy days, and they won't deliver, and they won't give service. I hate shopping centers, and I hate supermarkets. Housewife's dream today is for a centralized shopping center where she can go and in two hours complete all her shopping for the week and forget about it. As it is now uh, in Society Hill, uh, one place there's a grocery store, another place a laundry, another place a vegetable store, another place uh, a bakery, and uh, by the time you get done going two blocks here and three blocks there and two blocks the other way, it can take you at least five hours and a good pair of legs to do all your shopping. So debates about the shape of neighborhood change were really about much more than architectural style alone. Um, they're also about the ability of built forms, either existing or new, to accommodate growing planning preferences for separation of use in this post-war period. Now, neighborhood religious institutions also accounted for many spots of large-scale de demolition. Urban Renewal offered several of these institutions the unique opportunity to expand their footprints with the addition of new buildings like schools or, or parking lots. And they often, these uh, institutions often took the redevelopment authority up on their offers. This was the case at St. Peter's, an Episcopal church uh, located on the bottom right of this map, and Old Pine, a Presbyterian church in the middle bottom of that, of that plan. Not pictured here is a Catholic church, St. Mary's, located to the north, where the story was similar. And there are many other such institutions. Here's a zoom in to Old Pine and St. Peter's. Recall that on the left, the gray buildings are those that are going to be demolished. And on the right, you can see the illustrative site plan of what was to be built in its place. Old Pine would demolish two streets of buildings in order to take over almost the entirety of its Pine to Lombard, fourth to fifth street block. Here you can see the former mixed use buildings on the north side of Lombard, all of which were eradicated um, to create this, this new development. And here are the residential buildings on Addison Street, both the buildings and roadway of which would be completely removed from the map. Residents pleaded before city officials to be able to save their homes from plans for them to become a parking lot. Specifically, they proposed a rearrangement of the site that would still allow for the parking and new construction, but also allow them to keep their homes. Here's one homeowner who lived on Addison Street stating her case, including her willingness to go back to work again in order to afford the changes required to rehabilitate her house if it could be spared from, from demolition. Mr. Sobo, would you have in, uh, any objections to remodel your home according to the authority? No, we've been looking forward to all this because, Mr. D'Ortona, when we moved in this home, the floors were termite in the joists. And we had a coal stove for almost two years so we were able to put oil heat in. That was the reason I went to work. And it took all these years to do it. And we finally reached the goal when we paid off the mortgage uh, about six months ago. But you would uh, be Not willing to, to conform I to the authority. I would go back to work for it. You would go back yes, to work sir. for it just to live there. I'm in the local 195 for 19 years. 
Charles Peterson also lamented the loss of several historically certified buildings to make way for this old pine development. Pabs uh, photographed them in 1960 before the wrecking ball all came through. These were located on Lombard. In the place of these buildings and homes and community uh, residents, um, after an initial plan to build a home for the aged, an aborted attempt to build a, a, a swim club on the site and temporary use of the site as a community garden was built the Old Pine Community Center. Uh, this has become a neighborhood fixture, including providing gym for St. Peter's School and serving as a site for cooperative daycare organized by new arrivals to the renewing neighborhood. Um, today, it's an important site for distributing food. Uh, in COVID, it's been very important. Centers like this one provide crucial space for community services and gatherings as the renewal of a neighborhood requires more than just improved housing. And on the northern end of the block was constructed the Presbyterian Historical Society, which is a national research repository. Here again, another valued part of the community and, and where I conducted some of this research, in fact. But one of the unfortunate ironies, of course, is that historic buildings and long-standing communities had to come down to make room for a neo-colonial repository for historic records. Now, beyond housing and institutions alone, the plan for Society Hill also incorporated an integral set of pedestrian walkways, known as greenways, that knit the neighborhood together and created those kind of wonderful, um, you know, brick-lined uh, walkways um, that showcase the historic architecture and modern architecture as well. They also connected the neighborhood with Independence National Historical Park to the north. Uh, sometimes existing roads were closed to create these greenways, but in other cases, as in the area that I boxed in red here, making space for greenways required demolition as well. Um, this, this red box would be the place for part of St. Peter's Way. Here again, we see a bacon standing in what's now Three Bears Park, seemingly pointing out the path where St. Peter's Greenway would be established, creating a direct visual connection to the spire of St. Peter's Church. And on the right, you can see the buildings that were removed to realize Bacon's vision, or you can't see them, they were removed. You can see that new, uh, the swath of clearance. Landscape architect John Collins developed the specific design for the park. You can see in both his sketch and the photograph that the greenways were really important public spaces for neighborhood social life. Many residents reflect on them as one of the best parts of the neighborhood and critical for making space for community. The greenways connected parks and play spaces like Three Bears, and here's one urban renewal arrival, Libby Brown, talking about the significance of places like this park to creating a space for families, the types of households that Society Hill successfully attracted. Delancey Park or Three Bears Park opened up around that time, so that was a great magnet for us all. And mm -hmm. much of the social life was there. And of course, we were all helped by the babysitting co-op. And uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, I, I couldn't have managed without that. I think we all felt the same way. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and so developing good relationships, friendships with mm -hmm. the other mothers and the little right. kids and, yeah. you know, watching them all grow up together right. was really wonderful. Right. Libby's commentary really speaks to the fact that the creation of a new community um, or a renewed community uh, required much more than the new buildings, although I'm focusing a lot on the physical designs. Um, spaces for these community members to bond were part of that. But whereas a former police station occupied the site of Delancey Park, and that's how they were able to build that playground there, St. Peter's Way would require demolition of several houses, including two historically certified properties. At the time, the residents of this block were working class families. Uh, they included Russians, uh, Polish citizens, Germans, uh, people of Austri Austrian descent. Um, it's an immigrant block, and they typically occupied one floor of each property, so they were multifamily buildings. There was debate over which of these buildings to remove on both Delancey and Pine Streets. Now, Carol Aberkoff was a young girl living with her Polish-American family at 329 Pine Street, which is right near the location of the, of the future Greenway, when development was uh, redevelopment was coming. Her family lived there because her father worked several blocks away on Jewelers Row. And although their family took good care of their home, her mother feared that it would be taken from them to make way for the, the Greenway. So they sold their house in advance of having it taken from them. The city, um, here's Carol Aberkoff talking about the decision to sell. No, she didn't want to move, mm -hmm. but she was convinced that the redevelopment authority, which had broad powers mm -hmm. at that time, mm -hmm. would take our property because it was the only one that went all the way through right. to Delancey Street. And so the city did not ultimately choose their site. How could the Abercrofts have understood that uh, Bacon really was going to privilege that vista with the spire 
uh, but they too were displaced by re renewal, albeit indirectly, indirectly. And they wouldn't appear in any headcounts of people who were displaced because they left uh, before the redevelopment authority uh, knocked on their door. But displacement could occur even when no demolition had been planned. Uh, for example, when the cost of rehabilitation priced out renters from being able to still afford their former residences. This is what occurred at properties in the southwest corner of the neighborhood where that red box appears. The Octavia Hill Association, a settlement house organization that had been providing housing for low-income Philadelphians since the progressive era, owned a row of properties on the 600 block of Lombard Street. In the course of upgrading their properties as part of a renewal, they determined that they would need to displace their residents. They couldn't afford to do the rehabilitation work that the city required and still keep uh, low-income residents there. So Mabel Dodson and Mar Dorothy Miller, who are pictured here, were among a handful of African-American residents who fought back asking to be relocated within Society Hill rather than uh, moved elsewhere in the city. And here's a quote from Dorothy Miller, a who was a crossing guard for the neighborhood elementary school, talking about her reaction to being told she would have to move. I said, but I'll tell you what I think is happening. Mm -hmm. I think they're trying to get us out of here. Mm -hmm. And they're not shoving me just any old place. This is all we know. We grew up here. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going just where they want me to go. That's out of the question. So the battle over whether to construct new low-income housing for these longtime Society Hill residents divided the community, with some new residents supporting the effort and collaborating with Miller, and others arguing that the new housing would diminish their own property values. The debate nearly split the Civic Association in two. But after a protracted legal battle, the Octavia Hill 7, as these residents came to be called, won. The city constructed three clusters of new modern low-income housing that exist still today. And while these properties are small in number, right, it's 14 units, uh, their very existence demonstrates the possibility for neighborhood revitalization to occur without complete gentrification and displacement. In fact, the larger society he'll endeavor demonstrates that as well, at least to some degree. Now, Miller was a renter and she could not purchase the property where she resided, but existing property owners were typically given the option to purchase their building if they agreed to the requisite rehabilitation work. This was true of all the non sheeted properties in Unit 2 on this plan, the ones that I haven't really been talking about today. I've been talking about those gray death demolition sites. But of course, not all property owners could afford to take that work on, as even Ed Bacon himself noted. I guess you know that the redevelopment authority went around to each uh, homeowner and asked them, gave them the specification of what would have to be done to the house to restore it to the standards of historical accuracy, and then asked them if they would do it or whether they would <coughs> or whether they, if they wouldn't do it. Well, you don't ask them if they wouldn't do it. They would be condemned, inform them they would, but they gave them the option to do it. And of course, this obviously is a discriminatory thing in the sense that if they didn't have the money to do it, they had no choice. Of course, in most places, you don't have any choice at all in under urban renewal, whether you're rich or poor. <clears throat> the condemnation is simply there because it's the plan and the public interest, and you're compensated, and that's the end of it. So in that case, if you couldn't afford to do the work, the redevelopment authority would acquire the property and the old Philadelphia Development Corporation would market it to prospective purchasers, placing a sign like this one at the site by way of advertisement. By 1960, the redevelopment authority reported that it had sent 234 letters to Unit 2 residents asking if they were interested in rehabbing their homes. Three quarters of those surveys said yes, they would like to enter into agreements to keep their homes. And when new residents moved into the neighborhood then, they often lived side by side with long-term residents. This was not the norm in the typical original project in which clearance dominated, but it was possible in places like Society Hill where rehabilitation was part of the new design. And here are two such houses where the existing owners uh, performed the re renovations. Uh, the one on the left, uh, the, the Gogolsky family resided there and lived there for about five years before they sold it uh, to some new arrivals who continued the renovations that they hadn't yet completed. The one on the right was the Schmidt family. They lived there from 1948 before renewal and only sold, it passed down through generations. They only sold it uh, out of the family in 2008. And there are many other such stories for which the exterior of the property does not necessarily immediately tell us the social history of who stayed and who left. And yet, um, as I wrap up now, even with the opportunity for some to stay, the official count was that urban renewal displaced 580 families from Society Hill. And this is a figure that likely undercounts the total of think of families like Carol Abrakoff who moved without being um, um, officially displaced. Um, most of these families were not eligible for public housing, often because their families were too large in size. 
The majority of those families still relocated to other rental housing. In most urban renewal projects around the country, this new relocation housing was of a higher physical quality than that which they left behind. But as Mindy Fillilov and others have shown, the psychosocial losses of communities torn apart proved devastating in their own way. Population statistics from before and after renewal perhaps best demonstrate the change that had occurred in the community, even as, as I pointed out, um, several residents were able to stay. The, the dominant headline was of change due to both demolitions and the conversion of multifamily rental properties to single family owner occupied housing, the total population declined. Uh, but the population that remained was generally whiter, more affluent, affluent and more highly educated. Thanks to the introduction of high rise apartment buildings, the number of dwelling units actually increased. The value of those units also increased from three quarters of the city average to seven times the city average. So it's a much more expensive neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Society Hill likely would have changed regardless over this 30 year span, but urban renewal surely changed it more dramatically than otherwise. Overall then, thanks to the urban renewal plans focus on rehabilitation and re restoration rather than clearance, many important aspects of Society Hill have stayed the same, particularly relative to how many, how many neighborhoods were typically physically wiped away by urban renewal. For much of the neighborhood, however, preservation-based renewal also meant transformation of buildings, of land uses, and of populations. It yielded new built environments, new public spaces, and new community formations, albeit sometimes at the expense of those that came before them. The striking before and after photographs provide the visual proof of these dramatic changes while omitting much of the complexity and tension behind them. And so today, I hope I've helped illuminate some of that complexity, uh, much more complicated than what Slayton laid out in 1963, and yet also a bit different from the dominant story that we know when we think of the urban renewal program, which shows progress amidst loss um, and innovation alongside resistance that have helped make Society Hill what it is today. And I'll end on a final slide to just remind you about the website. I included some brief audio clips. If you're interested in hearing more of these stories of residents from before, during, and after renewal, uh, please check out Preserving Society Hill. It's a living site. Uh, we're still adding more uh, interviews, and I hope you'll find um, other material that piques your interest there. So thank you, and I'm happy to take uh, any questions in the time remaining. Thank you so much, Professor Ammon. That was a super engaging presentation and the, the range and breadth of multimedia material you showed in one hour was, was awe-inspiring. Um, I really enjoyed it. I'm sure others did as well. So we can now open up for questions. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's two options. You can either use the raise your hand feature and I'll call on you to unmute and ask your question directly. Um, or if you'd prefer, you can also just type your question uh, into the chat box. Um, so I, maybe I'll just go ahead and ask the first question to, to jump things off and get people thinking, but I was wondering if you could, um, talk a little bit more about like what I think in the New York context, we're so used to this dichotomy between Jacobs and Moses and that there were just two schools of, of planning thought at this time. And, and, he, and I wonder if in Philadelphia and this in Society Hill, were, were they responding to a kind of. Jacobs-esque critique on, uh, and, and, and making their plans accordingly? Or were they, I guess that's the first part of the question. And the second part of the question is, did this different approach end up sort of preventing the creation of, of a sort of Jacobs style anti-urban renewal coalition in Philadelphia? Or did that still emerge even though this was this softer, gentler, uh, more preservation oriented form of urban renewal? Thanks, Joe. Um, you know, great questions. Uh, the time-wise, you know, this is all happening as Jane Jacobs is working out her thinking, right? So her book is 61. These plans are, are 58, 59. So it's not, you know, she's obviously writing before that too. So I don't know that it's necessarily a reaction to Jacobs, although she came to Philadelphia and met with Bacon and others. She talks about Rittenhouse Square, I think, in, in Death and Life. Um, and so she was thinking about this place, and actually she was kind of celebrating it too. So, so it probably is informed a little bit by Jacobs' uh, kind of thinking. But I think, you know, it, it really had to do a lot with the, the planners in Philadelphia trying to distinguish their city and trying to find a way to harness history as something that makes this place a little bit different. And then being really practical about this is going to be an affordable way for us to do this, right? We're going we're gonna to just not fall into some of the traps that other people are having about the slow nature of, of the clearance work and everything. And they do, as, as you know, Joe, from, from having studied here and, and others know too, 
plenty of clearance in other projects. It's a question of which sites are kind of uh, deemed worthy of, of rehabilitation. A lot of the downtown development uh, was clearance based for uh, for office buildings, a lot for high, um, sorry, for uh, public housing, there are plenty of clearance and high rises uh, for those too. But again, you know, I come back to the fact of, you know, this was largely a white neighborhood and these are the neighborhoods that were picked out for something different some of the time. Now there, there are exceptions too. Um, if, if you know Philadelphia, there's the Mill Creek, not, not Mill Creek, um, the Morton neighborhood up in Germantown, which was another, um, really important example of rehabilitation. There was new construction too, but there was rehabilitation as well. It was a largely African-American neighborhood and uh, a lot of residents were able to stay too. So it's not entirely the case, but it's the dominant story that this kind of centrally located white neighborhood was one that people thought was worth taking the kind of extra effort, I think, to do something a little bit different. So I don't know exactly uh, Jacobs's place, but um, your second question about were the coalitions that resulted different. Um, I think you have a lot of the same sorts of things. Um, you know, Bacon, he didn't just, he did um, smaller scale developments, not just towers um, in, in some other areas. He partnered with Quaker groups to try to provide affordable housing. So he was trying to do some different things. And I think that did get more people on board early on. But highways were the exact same story as anywhere else. And, and Jacobs's reaction and Urban Hills anti-urban renewal activism is intimately tied up with highways. And we have that with the Vine Street Expressway, which tore through Chinatown, which the Crosstown, the Crosstown Expressway would have torn through um, South Street and, and parts of South Philly had it been built. And there was a very strong activist sentiment um, and organization that stopped that. So you still have the activism, but I think there was a little bit more partnership in some of these, in some of these projects that did make them, um, you know, um, there was more experimentation and partnership that was a little bit different um, in Philadelphia. And so Philadelphia is doing this kind of thing earlier. You see, you know, um, you see Ed Logue is doing rehabilitation later on in his career too, but, but Philadelphia started doing it earlier than other places, driven by that kind of pragmatism and driven by the architecture that inspired them, I think, a little bit um, to do something different. Great, thanks. Uh, Carolyn has a question. Hi, and thank you so much for this um, really fascinating talk. And I'll definitely look very differently at uh, Society Hill buildings in the future. I, I really never would have thought that so many of them had uh, formerly been storefronts. Um, so also great to um, see you and speak with you again. <laughs> um, so my question actually builds a bit off of um, your response to um, Joe's question. I'm wondering if you could speak to the process that was used to determine which of these neighborhoods would be appropriate for rehabilitation, since it seems so clear, right, that um, there, there was a difference, that these uh, whiter neighborhoods were more likely to be deemed worthy of, of rehabilitation rather than being cleared. Um, and I know for clearance, um, my understanding is that to be you know, deemed um, worthy of eminent domain or unworthy as the case may be, um, that a lot of states would pass laws requiring specific showings that areas were deemed blighted and would put forth some criteria of what that looked like. Um, so I'm curious if there was anything like that for rehabilitation where they would say, you know, these criteria are for blighted neighborhoods that need to be torn down, these are for rehabilitation, or if there were other ways that they kind of managed to inject subjectivity into that process to um, create that bifurcated system. Thanks, Carolyn. Yeah, great, great to see you again as well. Um, you know, the, I don't know the answer to your question, but I think there are sources that could uh, help here. So in, in the 40s, Philadelphia conducted a, a health survey of, of many of the neighborhoods and uh, it would be interesting to compare how they graded the different neighborhoods and properties versus what kind of renewal approach was applied there. Um, and, and that would that would get to what you're you're thinking about. And does subjectivity enter um, enter the equation? I'm, I'm sure it does. I'm guessing it does. Uh, but but can we map building conditions in any way to what kind of approach was applied? Um, so if I don't know the answer and I, I haven't done that kind of um, you know extensive look, but uh, I suspect that it was a combination because blight was such an amorphous thing, right? Um, and it, um, they really, in, in Philadelphia, in, in Society Hill, they could have made the case for clearance. I mean, the, the surveys show, you know, the dilapidated conditions of the buildings, the absence of certain utilities and services. They could, they had the ability to do that, um, but they, they opted against it. Um, but they still exercised eminent domain. So even for rehabilitation, first, the, 
for unit one, um, this is the case. They acquired all the properties and then they would sell them back to the people who lived there. So they, they still had that same power because the properties were in this condition that for the public good, you know, they need the government needed to step in. So that step, that's an interesting step. Now in unit two, they didn't acquire all the properties. And I don't know why that was exactly. Unit two happened second. Um, and I suspect it got, um, you know, they really did want to encourage much more of people staying because you didn't have many people stay at all in unit one. And I suspect that getting rid of that rebuying it was uh, was facilitating that. But I have to look into that more as well. But you wouldn't necessarily expect there to still be eminent domain when you end up with the same people living in the property. But you do. And that ownership also uh, enables the government to impose those legally impose into the title, um, you know, what's required in terms of the rehabilitation specifications. So it's still an important tool, whether you're rehabbing or clearing eminent domain was really crucial to giving governments power to exert their influence over what the neighborhood should look like um, physically. Does anyone else have any questions? Maureen? Yeah, thank you so much, Francesca, for this fascinating presentation. I think I also echo um, Carolyn and, and, and Joe saying the um, mixed media approach to a PowerPoint presentation made it much uh, uh, richer and, and um, I guess more tangible for us to get it like a, a good feeling of what was happening at the time. Um, I have a specific question about what would happen if families had initially agreed to uh, the preservation uh, gu guideline specifications um, and then could not afford to complete that within the, the time limit they had. You had set uh, two years. I've, I've seen examples of this in, in different parts of the world, um, but I was wondering um, if they would get, you know, I was wondering what would happen um, to families who had agreed, who tried to invest, started, but then didn't make it on time. Yeah, it's a great uh, question. I think that the two-year um, time frame wound up being difficult for everyone. So even you know C.J. Moore, who obviously had resources, he spent so much on uh, restoring his property and, and changing the interior. It took him more than the two years. So two years wasn't reasonable for anyone. Um, so they didn't really harp on that, and they gave people more leeway as they figured that out over time. But I think it's when you got more like at the five year mark and things still hadn't happened, then the, then the government could come in and um, and reacquire the property. Um, and you did see that sort of thing happen. I think more commonly they would be encouraged to sell, which which is probably what happened at that one property that I showed towards the end that I said they lived for, for five years and then another uh, couple came in. I think that was kind of like the informal way that the, the outcome was still achieved. Um, they, they were generally trying not to be um, super confrontational. They're, trying um, not to physically displace as much as they could, although they had the power to. So they wanted to let the, the kind of private market work it out. And they had set up this really robust private market where they, they the city organized um, the, basically their own realtors to market these properties. So they had a very easy way to connect prospective buyers. They organized walking tours to show people what the neighborhood was all about so that they could make those uh, private market connections, which is another one of the appeals of rehab getting the government less involved in the mechanics of this and letting people kind of run it themselves because it was it was a vast bureaucratic um, undertaking that had to take place. So that's generally what would happen. Um, but you also had people who purchased properties who didn't deliver on, on what they said they would do too. And I found many examples of that where the property would turn over, turn over you know, one, two, three times to different property owners because they couldn't act. They didn't, I don't think they knew <laughs> what they were uh, taking on or or maybe they changed their, their mind for whatever reason. And so again, it would just be kind of thrown back into the, um, into the pool of properties being marketed. Um, the, the character of residents who really managed to purchase and stay um, or, um, uh, were, were generally younger couples who did a lot of the work themselves because it was a big undertaking, but they were able to, you know, save money. There were a lot of architects, actually, who were, you know, students at Penn who, who purchased properties, and um, that would get the cost of this down because it really was quite expensive to do, um, to do the work that was required, both aesthetically on the outside, but also from a systems perspective um, on the inside. So it, it was like clearance. It was not as smooth and simple as they thought, um, but to the extent that the private market could solve it, I think that was appealing to planners. Mm 
So that last comment is actually quite related to the first question we have in the chat, um, which is from Paul. And he asks um, if you could talk a bit more about the complicity of architects, landscape architects, interior designers, sociologists, other seemingly progressive professions in the selective clearance of Society Hill. And also if you studied the implications that so many of those same professionals chose to reside in the revamped neighborhood. Yeah, so um, I haven't exhaustively studied um, the professions of the individuals, but looking at the you know the hundred oral histories and and seeing what professions were um, part of that, architects, lawyers, doctors, these are these are popular ones, and I think it's about um, you know the amount of money, uh, the, the income levels of some of these professions. Maybe not the architects, but they could um, they could use their own uh, labor to to support the costs here. Um, but we have to remember also that. Um, people would have thought of this as better than the kind of displacement that was happening um, in some of these other mural projects. They were living alongside people who had been resident there before. So I'm not even, I, I, these were actually, and you see this come through in the, um, in the battle over the Octavia Hill housing that I talked about at the end of the talk, that these were people who definitely identified as progressives and wanted an integrated neighborhood when they had this chance to try to advocate for some of the residents to stay. It was often actually the existing property owners who were worried about um, the neighborhood um, diversifying even more and the value of their property going down. And those weren't professionals. They, they were much more working class people. So it, it's, it's an inversion a little bit of what you'd expect. But at the same time, we know that the arrival of these groups did displace, right? And I, and I think that that's... Um, Certainly some people would have been aware of this too, but even the dean of the School of Design called the Graduate School of Fine Arts at that time, um, he moved into the neighborhood too. Um, and, you know, what's going on at, at Penn at this time, you have, um, you know, Paul Davidoff and, and advocacy planning, and you have a, a very progressive um, kind of way of thinking about the planning profession. And then you have the dean moving into this gentrifying neighborhood too. So, I don't know, I, I haven't found anyone reflecting upon this, um, but I didn't see people avoiding um, the neighborhood for that reason. Um, and, and it was basically whoever could afford to live there. Um, you mentioned sociologists. I don't know, I don't know that that was, um, that anyone fit that bill, there, there could have been. There were also African-Americans who moved into the neighborhood too, affluent African-Americans who, um, some of whom I'm aware of, moved into some of the newer properties too. Um, so it, it was basically a function of ability to afford um, that shaped who selected to move in the, to the neighborhood. And it was a lot cheaper than anywhere else in the city if you were trying to get somewhere because you had you started out with this, this shell, at least cheap at the outset, right? Expensive in the end, but cheap at the outset to actually buy that first home. I, I know it's a little bit rambling comment, Paul. Uh, I hope that I responded. Okay, uh, we have one more question. Let's just... Um ask it and then we'll wrap up. Uh, that's from Jenna and she asks, what factors might have led to the decline of this preservation based renewal practice in cities? For example, did community development block grants create a bias for larger redevelopment projects? No, I don't, I don't know that there was necessarily um, a decline. Um, and I guess probably the difference is pr preservation versus rehabilitation. Uh, Society Hill spurred other rehabilitation-based renewal uh, practices. Queen Village is a neighborhood just to the south of Society Hill, and they specifically looked to Society Hill and said, we want to do that, but we want to do it in a way that we can all stay. Um, and so they did it. They formed their own organization. It wasn't, there was no government, um, government didn't come in and tell them to do it. They organized, and they took advantage of some community development block grants to, to spur rehab work. So I don't, I don't know that it, um, that it went away. It's just always been this kind of smaller piece of the pie, as I showed those those charts before, about that the um, demolition was dominating. There were still uh, um, CDBG grants that funded demolition as well. Um, so it, it's always been there, but I don't know that we've talked about it enough. It just, it was never flashy, right? It didn't get as much of the press. Um, and if it wasn't organized on a neighborhood scale, if it was a couple of homeowners here and there, I just don't think we know as much about this kind of work. And it's been left out of, of a lot of the narratives. And, and I think what's really important about it is that I'd love to see more rehabilitation be part of, you know, contemporary effort, efforts for affordable housing and things like this. You know, in cities like Philadelphia, where we have a lot of vacant buildings, um, I'd like to see us think more about rehabilitation and, and, and the fact that we have historic fabric being something 
positive that can be contributing to a sense of place rather than um, that we need to clear that down and, and build something new. So I want to elevate more of these stories um, and, and show how they worked and show warts and all, right, what the problems were. Um, but I also want to look more into these other neighborhoods, not Society Hill, where it was done more cheaply um, and can potentially provide a model for today. Great. Well, we're at time. Uh, so I just want to thank uh, you again, Professor uh, Ammon, for such a great talk today and for joining us and taking the time to join us. Um, and thanks to all those who attended and uh, make sure to join us next week as well for our talk with uh, Dr. Romola Sanyal. Um, so thank you again.